embrace of peace as I look to you alone. Fill me with your love. Mountains high or valleys low, you will never let me go. By your fountain let me drink. Fill my thirsty soul. Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Blessed Jesus, come to me as I fall down at your feet. Let me touch your nail-scarred hands, Jesus, I will see. Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. Lorelai Van Pelt, uh, great granddaughter of Walter Jordan, with Jody in the baptistry. Hi, welcome everybody. This is Lorelai, and she is 11 years old and has been uh, talking about studying and praying about baptism for a good while now. Uh, along with uh, her granddad, Walter Jordan, her, her parents are Leslie and David Gray and Casey Van Pelt, and she's got a whole crew right over in here, here to watch this today. Um, if you're a guest with us today and this brings up questions for you, we'd love to talk about that uh, offline, so don't, don't hesitate to give us a call about it. Uh, but I want to read you what, um, what she wrote, because this is, these are Lorelai's words and they're amazing, and it, it gives you an idea about what's been going, through, going on in her heart and in her head and in her spirit. So here, here's what she wrote. I want to get baptized because I want to someday enter the kingdom of heaven and be forgiven of all my sins. I know I don't deserve to be saved. No one does. We are saved by grace. I know that Jesus did not have to die on the cross. He could have just said, I don't want to do this. And then we wouldn't be able to go to heaven. But he did not say that. He went out there and he suffered just for us because he loves us. God sent his one and only son to the cross so that we can someday be with him in heaven. I believe that Jesus is the son of God and that, he is the, and that he is perfect, and he loves us much. I want the Holy Spirit to live in me. And that's Lorelai Van Pelt. That is awesome right there. Lorelai, thank you. So Lorelai, you said this in, the, in your note, but uh, I know that everybody wants to hear you say it with your own voice. Uh, so I wanna ask you a question that a lot of uh, people have been asked through the centuries. Um, and they've, they've answered with the answer you're gonna to give today, and it's the most important answer to any question you will ever give. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Based on your confession, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit.
Good morning. It's great to be here, isn't it? Wasn't that marvelous? Wow. What a wonderful confirmation that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Amen? What a way to start the day. Uh, we have a, a different day today. We're going to be talking quite a bit about our mission in Ecuador for the children of Ecuador. And, uh, you know, I think you, most of you probably know I have a passion for that. And many of you share that passion with me. And so it's going to be a, a fun day uh, Justin and John Arriga are here. Uh, some of you may have seen them at different times this week. They've been here this week, and we're going to have a time to talk with them and, and discuss the mission. So it's going to be exciting. If you're a guest here today, it's still going to be interesting. <laughs> uh, I hope you can find the same passion that many of us have. Uh, but as you're here today, if, if there's cards in front of the, the seats in front of you, if you would fill that out and let us know that you came, uh, just so we can have a record of that attendance and know that you're visiting with us, we'd appreciate that. You know, it's a dreary day outside and kind of dark, but you know, uh, Jesus is the light of the world, and we are the light, and we're supposed to be reflecting him, and today we're going to come into the presence of God, and there's no darkness where God is, right? So let's, let's have some wonderful light uh, today in our worship, uh, so join us in worship. Let's stand and say hi to someone around us. Salvation, 
Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men, counselor, comforter. John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. Then who are you? Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? No. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, 
I'm the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. place that Lisa and I lived in Georgia was out in the country, and in the evenings, we like to take walks down uh, this long country lane near where we live, very little traffic, uh, very narrow road, and we called it Christmas Tree Road. It, it's not really the name, but that's what we called it, because about three quarters of the way down the road, there was a Christmas tree farm, and the guy that ran it was about 106 years old and uh, it was just beautiful to walk by and he kept it trimmed really neatly the the rows trimmed very neatly and then in the late fall he would he and his sons and somebody else would come out and, and trim the Christmas trees for sale in late November and in December and I remember when we would when we would walk in the evenings uh, at, at that time of year, the air was filled with the scent of spruce and pine and cedar, and it was such a clean uh, Christian smell. It was just, it was just beautiful, the, the aroma in the air. And then we'd get back to the house, and you could still smell that clean smell on your clothes. Our summer walks down that road were not so pleasant uh, for two reasons. One, uh, there were a lot of copperheads in that area, and for some reason they enjoyed basking on the road in the afternoons. And my job was to walk 10 feet in front of Lisa. So if somebody got bit, it was going to be me. Uh, the other reason that was an unpleasant walk was because the farmer that owned the Christmas tree farm also had goats. And goats are cute, and I have a lot of my friends that would like to have a goat, and they're fun to watch, and, and they stink. 
They smell really, really bad, especially when it rains. Um, one day when we were on that walk, we were in a wooded part of the road. There's just the, the forest just sort of narrows in on it. And we heard a scream in the woods. Um, it sounded like a baby, like somebody had left a baby in the woods. And then we realized it was one of the, one of the little goats, one of the kids calling for its mother. It was the most unearthly scream I'd ever heard. It was really unsettling. It was very unsettling. Um, and I think about that now and again when I'm reading the Old Testament, particularly the stuff that we've been reading through lately in Leviticus about the sacrifices. I don't know if, what you think about that, but in my mind, for the longest time, places like the tabernacle and the temple were like a museum, like they were like art museums, you know, clean and stately and noble and everything was very peaceful and calm and it smelled like bread because didn't they always have bread in the temple and the tabernacle? And, and maybe a Levite would chant some sacred chant and it would echo through the halls and it would, it would uh, cascade off all the walls and touch every heart and grace every year. And it just, as I, as I make a little mental movie in my mind about the tabernacle and the temple and what went on, it was such a holy holy and sacred and peaceful and calm place, and that's not the way it was at all. The temple and the tabernacle were slaughterhouses. Um, there was blood, and there was stench, and there were screams. The throats of lambs and young bulls were slit. The viscera was separated and burned. Blood by the gallon was sloshed up on the, on the altar. It looked like a crime scene. And smelled like death. And if you and I don't like reading about it, imagine what it was like to live it, because that's how those people went to church. Why, why did God require, in, in, if you've been reading in Leviticus, why did he require in mind-numbing detail these grisly rituals? Why, why did the worshiper have to lay his hand on the head of the animal he was about to butcher and look into its innocent eyes and feel the warmth of its life that he was moments away from ending. But why did God command priests to stand to ankle deep in blood and guts all day long and carry home with them the smell of that slaughter even as Lisa and I carried home with us the smell of freshly cut pine? This is what was required by God for the sins of the people. That's why. The innocent dying for the guilty. It was the incessant, the daily reminder that to sin is to die. The sacrifices were teaching moments for the Israelites in the economics of sin. And the lesson was simple. Sin is expensive. The cost of sin is exorbitant. It is beyond your means to pay. You had to bring something. It didn't matter if you owned the cattle on a thousand hills or all you could scrape together was two birds. You had to bring something to give its life for yours. And the sounds and the smells and the sights of that dying were to stay with you and to remind you that God is holy and you too are called to be holy. Now you and I, we graciously live at a great distance from that awful way of doing liturgy, but there's still something for us to learn. The sacrifices the ancient Hebrews had to offer, like a lot of other things in the Old Testament, are shadows of a more substantial reality. They point to another lamb. He hung on a cross-shaped altar that stood on a skull-shaped hill. Jesus became the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Our time at the table on Sunday mornings is how we enter into that scene. The Israelites were not able to unsee or unhear or unsmell the slaughter that they had participated in when they made their sacrifices. And our prayer should be this morning that the sacrifice of Jesus sticks with us as surely as the smell of blood and ashes stuck to Israel's people long after the smoke of their sacrifice is cooled.
Let's pray together as we receive this bread and this cup. And let's be grateful for Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, the lamb who gave his life for us. Father, even with scholars who can unpack the meaning of the sacrifices for us, with the many books that have been written, with the study that has been done, we still struggle to grasp the why. The explanations that can be offered only take us so far. But we pray that we will understand enough to know that Jesus gave himself for us. We don't know exactly what that means or how that works, but we know that just as Lorelai said in her note to us this morning, he could have said, I don't want to do this, but he didn't say that. And so somehow his death sets us free from the consequences of our sin which reminds us of how very expensive sin is because of what it costs. We pray that the taste of this bread will linger in our mouths throughout the morning and throughout the week. And by remembering, we will live better. We will live more like he lived. Thank you for this bread. In Jesus' name, amen.
is amazing that you can take violence and turn it into a way to bring peace. It is unbelievable that you can take blood and make of it something clean and pure. And yet on the cross in the blood of Jesus, you did exactly that. And we are grateful. As we share this cup, we pray that we will be be thankful for all of the sins from which you've delivered us and that we in turn will be able to forgive others as they've sinned against us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Soon and very soon, my King is coming, robed in righteousness and crowned with love. When I see Him, I shall be made like Him, soon and very soon. Soon. them.
my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. You are my sacred. So every March, we take up a special contribution to fund the one and only foreign mission work that we are involved in. It's called Hacienda of Hope. It's in Tabacundo, Ecuador. And uh, many of you have visited there in the past, so you know all about it. And if you haven't been or if you don't know, Hacienda uh, of Hope is a home for abused and neglected children in Ecuador. The staff there works to provide these children with a safe environment where they can heal and hear the good news about Jesus and do the things that children are supposed to do, like play and pretend and explore and ask questions and ask some more questions and then some more, and to wonder and to go to school. In fact, they attend the school, they attend school at the Hacienda of Hope Academy right there on uh, the campus. Uh, as you can imagine, it's an imposing project, but our folks on the front line are instruments in the hands of an impressive God, and they are doing some great things. This morning, we have the directors of Hacienda of Hope with us, Justin and John Rieger, and to introduce them, I want you to watch a video. Uh, this is their mentor in ministry. He's one of the most respected voices in the United States when it comes to uh, the care for at-risk children. His name is Len Harms. He's past president and CEO of the Children's Home of Lubbock, Texas. Give him a listen. Hello, I'm Len Harms, and I'm the past president of the Children's Home of Lubbock. And over the last five years, I've had the opportunity to visit the Hacienda of Hope in Tabacundo, Ecuador. And I want to applaud you and thank you for the work that you're doing there. 
is so vital in caring for traumatized, abused, neglected children of that region. I've appreciated especially the leadership that John and Justin Rieger have brought uh, to that program. Now, I'll admit, I'm a little bit partial uh, when it comes to Justin and Jonna. They met and married while working for us at the Children's Home of Lubbock. But they took what they learned at the Children's Home and they went uh, beyond that, gaining both of them master's degrees in social work, uh, doing other work with traumatized children, and have uh, done an excellent job of bringing their skills and their knowledge to the leadership uh, of the Hacienda of Hope. One of the things that I appreciate about the Jonna and Justin and the entire leadership team at the Hacienda is a desire to blend uh, the highest possible spiritual motivation for being there uh, with best practice and best, best methodology in caring for children uh, that can be found anywhere across this world. John and Justin have done an excellent job in uh, blending culturally uh, for the children, uh, direct care staff and counselors who are uh, from that region of the world, uh, along with several staff who have come from the states. I think this has allowed them to blend uh, that, that spiritual ministry and motivation along with best practice uh, uh, processes and methodologies in the care of children. I've had the opportunity to visit children's homes all across our country and especially church-supported children's homes. And I can tell you that the care that the children receive at, at the Hacienda of Hope is, is better than the majority of the care that children are provided in our church-related programs here in the States. Uh, the, Justin and Jonna are developing a model that I think will be picked up and utilized all across South America. I want to encourage you in continuing your, your support and your encouragement uh, with this program. Uh, it's vital. Uh, it, it, the, the CASAs are full. Uh, there are ideas for how to expand services. Uh, the leadership are willing to think outside the box and to do whatever it takes to meet the needs of children. Uh, and so for me as a professional to get to be involved in a part of this ministry has been extremely exciting. So I want to say thank you and God bless you uh, for the work that you're doing. Uh, in Tabacundo at the Hacienda of Hope. You are bringing hope to many, many children. Thank you. Hey, join me in welcoming uh, the two coolest missionaries on the planet, Justin and Jonna. So, welcome to Alabama. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We enjoy Alabama. Yeah, so do I. I, I found a wife here. It's awesome. So, Justin, let's start with you. Uh, since uh, a lot of us haven't been to Tabacundo, uh, give us a sense of the geography, the scenery, what it's like, um, how far you are from the equator. And this is a question that I've been dying to ask. Does the water really flow the other way around when you flush? I want to know that. So, so we'll start with that one first, since that's the most important. Uh, we are right on the equator. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, we're just a little bit off of the equator. So the water doesn't actually flow anywhere, it goes straight down. <laughs> it's the craziest thing. I just blew his mind, didn't I? Uh-huh. Okay. I have no idea which way the water goes. <laughs> I was going to say, because I've been there, and I don't remember it doing that. <laughs> I would have remembered that. <laughs> but no, tell us about the, just the kind of... The, the area there, because I know so that Mount Kayambe is really beautiful. And right. I, I, we grew up in, uh, well, I grew up in Lubbock, Texas, and it's almost exactly like that, uh, but there are volcanoes <laughs> and trees. Uh, and we, we, we were actually about just under 10,000 feet uh, at the Hacienda of Hope and almost right on the equator. Uh, so, so there uh, we don't get the, the fun weather like we do here, so the, the extreme cold was quite a shock. Uh, coming into Alabama, we appreciate y'all holding out and uh, giving us some cool weather. Uh, it's springtime year-round, and so for us, it's uh, it's a wonderful place uh, to live in. Uh, that's that's Mount 
Cayambe right mm-hmm. there, right? Yes, there. and so this is uh, actually a shot taken off our back porch. Wow. Um, and you can see all the way across the valley, you can see the valley of Cayambe down through the bottom, and then Mount Cayambe, which is an active volcano. It usually erupts once every 200 years or so. Um, so when, when was the last time? Uh, we're actually past due. Okay. So, Anybody want to come go visit. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your facilities now. Oh, well, I think we shot of, of, of Tabacundo, too, the street. I think we have that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, street, yeah, the city. Uh, so, yeah. so this will give you a little aspect of uh, what it looks like down some of the local streets. Uh, and uh, this is where we uh, go to uh, go do our shopping and uh, um, go to eat. There's a bakery on one of these streets. That's oh, there's a bakery on just about every one. Phenomenal. Uh-huh. So. Fresh break bed, break to Baked, baked bread, bread. <laughs> something like that. Uh-huh. <laughs> Tell us about your facilities now on the campus itself. Uh, so the campus uh, is made up of the children's home and the academy. Uh, on both those campuses, uh, there are a number of constructions uh, that have been built over the years uh, that allow us to serve the kids. Uh, so up in the top, uh, top left box up there, you can actually see uh, almost the entire 35 acres uh, that it sits on. You can see the school way up at the top and the children's home uh, down there in the bottom section of that, which is... Those are the casas right there. That is it. There are four of those, is that right? There are four casas. Right in the middle there. Mm -hmm. And that's where our children stay uh, and uh, stay with their house parents. And so uh, we're able to they're able to walk up that hill every day and then, a couple times a day. And then just below the four casas is the activity building where I think... Uh, some of our folks work there, I think, and mm-hmm. I think we've got a shot of some of our people working there. Now, what, 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 are you, what were they doing? In- uh, well, okay, so we have springtime weather, but it rains about nine months out of the year. Uh, so for us, uh, we've got lots of outdoor area, and that's great. Our kids play lots of soccer, and uh, that's quite a problem when they're wanting to play soccer, and it's raining outside in the afternoons. Uh, so this group came in from Twickingham and actually poured the foundation underneath. It was, it was an old dairy barn, and uh, they poured the foundation underneath the slab for us to be able to use year-round uh, during the rainy season. So our kids can go under there and play uh, soccer, basketball. There's even a trampoline under there, ping-pong table. So uh, it gives us the opportunity to be out, outside in a covered area. The, now, who's the girl doing the impossible <laughs> right there? Uh-huh. This is Maria. And uh, she, she loves a trampoline. Does she live with you guys? She, she does live with us. I played checkers with that girl when I was down there. I couldn't beat her. So <laughs> she's either going to be an Olympic <laughs> trampoline girl or an Olympic checkers player. I don't know which. So. Awesome. So you got a new building going up around down there too. So you guys new new some new. We do. Uh, there is a uh, new gym. Uh, that's up at the school, and there's also our administration building and counseling suites uh, that are um, are near completion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing that you need to know about that, you know, we always go, well, we hate for money to go to administrative stuff. Right now, if they need to have meetings with their staff or with families or with kids, they meet at their house. Um, And they do all of their staff meetings at their house. They do their counseling at their house. They do all of their administrative work at their house. That would be like if your boss says, we got to have a staff meeting, we're coming to your house to do it. That would not be cool. So uh, this... we, we wake up and people are actually at our house. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, I, and, they go, and they'll sometimes go to bed with people still at their house. So this, this, is, a, this is an important thing. You've got you to have this. It gives oh, you yes. the opportunity to do some counseling with families in a very private setting. Where you they, bet. They, okay. Very, very needed. Uh, tell me about your staff now. How many do you have on staff? Uh, so there are 25 people on staff at the Hacienda of Hope. Uh, there's another 30 some odd uh, people on staff with the school uh, as teachers and administration there as well. And most of these folks are from Ecuador, right? Uh, yes, quite a few of our, uh, of, of our staff are from Ecuador. Uh, we do have some staff uh, from, from the U.S. Uh, that are also down there. Most of our house parents, I guess all of our house parents at this point in time, mm-hmm. are all uh, Ecuadorian nationals. And so they live there permanently with the kids. Uh, We have relief staff that come in during the afternoons uh, to help out and give um, individualized services to make sure the kids are getting the needs they need to be met. We also have family therapists, three family therapists that uh, have degrees in social work and psychology. 
uh, that work directly with the families. So that's a big staff. How many kids do you guys have right now? Uh, well, we talked the other day and we had 40. Uh, we have 42 now. Okay, we were actually in a meeting on Monday talking about today and the phone rang and they got two new kids. So it's so you're at 42. Do you have room for everybody? Oh, well, no, no, no. Since we got that, we got two more. Oh, two more. Okay, 44. So, well, no, no, no. We're, we were at 40 and we're at 42. Okay. So we went to 40 during the meeting that we had and then we were at 42 by 42. the end of the next day. Okay, wow. The, let's turn the phone off for now. So, do you, have, do you have room for all those? We do have room for all of them at the moment, yes. Okay. If we get a few more, we may be pushing it. John, here's a question that I wondered about. And I know you guys got this phone call. How do you, how do you find out about the kids, or how do the kids find out about you? How does that happen? Um, we now are receiving them through the... Um, the state. The state, the Child Protective Services. So they call... They call us and say, you know, we have this age... Um, and they're male, female, can you take them in? And usually we say yes, unless we say no. And, you, and I'm assuming that, that you try to work with the families too. It's not just, you, you, your goal is not for the kids to be there permanently, but you want them to get back into their families, yes. right? Yes, yes. Our, our goal the minute they come in is to meet their families, figure out what's going on, um, what's going on wrong in the home to be able to gradually work with the parents to change that so we can put the child back in the home. I bet that gets awkward sometimes. It gets really hard sometimes, yes. It was yeah. uh, this last, um, this last admission that we got, uh, the one just the other day, um, we weren't there and, and uh, the referral seemed a little, um, seemed a little vague. And so we asked them uh, to, to, to help Give us some, give some concrete exam, you know, give us some concrete bits on what's going on. Uh, they actually sent a video, uh, a video clip that a neighbor took of um, of this family. Uh, we won't actually be showing that clip today, uh, but the uh, it was only about a thirty second video clip, and uh, you see the neighbor kind of peer over one of the edges of the buildings and uh, start hearing some screams. Uh, so talking about the violence and the screams that you were hearing. Um, you could hear the screams of one of the little boys. Uh, as the video comes into play, you see his, his mother and you see this naked little boy um, and he's already screaming and she starts whipping him around by the head on his hair, takes him to the ground, uh, continues to beat on him uh, in this 30 second clip of violence. And so for us, um, we know that there's violence in the homes. We know that there's abuse. Um, but it's, it's a totally different thing to be reminded in full color and video on how brutal that can be. Yeah. Um, so, so you bet. When we work with families, um, it's rough. It's rough. We work with families who are in really hard spots. Uh, we work with children who are just just living through awful situations. That's the thing that I think if you were wondering, what can I pray for this mission? One of the things you definitely want to pray for is protection for you guys because, you know, you, you look into that abyss, uh, that violence, and you, you fight those monsters, and, and it, that looks back. So mm -hmm. that affects you. John, the last time you were here, or maybe the time before, you, you told us about a girl named Blanca. That's a, now, that story is heartbreaking right there. That you just told Justin, but John, you told us a story about a girl named Blanca. We've got a clip uh, in just a second, but about you having a conversation with her, but can you set that up for us a little bit and remind us about that story, how she came to you and where she was spiritually and what was going on with her? Sure. Um, Blanca came with her five siblings, came to the children's home. Uh, three of those, three of the girls, so her and two other sisters had been being abused by their father. Um, and so we received them and I was actually teaching a class at church and we were talking about, you know, God wanting to be a part of their lives and, and we'll always be by, by them and by their side. And, um, that night she had a pretty big panic attack and told me, you know, she looked in my eyes and she was, she, she's the sweetest. She's one of those that smiles when she's really uncomfortable. I'm sure none of you guys do that. But Blanca just smiles, and you're like, oh, something's going on. Um, but she, she, uh, she looked at me and said, I, 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 I love being here, and I know that you guys saved me from the situation I'm in. 
But I don't want to be disrespectful, but I, it's really hard for me to believe in the God that you're talking about because I've cried to him over and over in the past years, and um, he's never helped me. So that's kind of where Blanca came from as far as how she saw God. And um, she was very respectful but said, no, thank you. Okay, and you know what? I think a lot of people have been there, and maybe some of us are there even right now, where we've asked God to do something and he didn't come through for us, yeah. and we're wondering where is he. Well, we, we've got a clip of an interview that Jonna did with Blanca after she had been at, at the Hacienda for a while, and so let's, let's take a look and see how this turned out. Dime su opinión. ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué sentías de Dios antes de llegar aquí? No sé, pensaba que no estaba de mi lado porque si estuviera de mi lado no, no hubiese pasado lo que me pasó. Ya, yeah. ok. Muy bien. Y ahora dime un poquito de qué sientes ya. ¿Qué, qué son sus sentimientos y pensamientos acerca de Dios? No sé, siempre pienso que Dios está conmigo en donde quiera que estoy y siempre... Siempre me protege, me guía, y no me falta nada. Y le agradezco mucho a Dios porque es, Él es el único que está a mi lado. Qué bien. ¿Por qué crees que eso ha cambiado? Porque... <risa> porque creo que las personas realmente, las personas que nos cuidan y... Los que están aquí necesitan algo para nosotros, algo mayor, y siempre quieren lo mejor para nosotros. Desde que, llegó, desde que llegué aquí, cambió mi vida. Ahora soy una chica normal. <risa> Eso es chévere. Entonces, ¿sientes que puedes hablar con Dios ya? Sí. ¿Sientes enojo con Dios ya? No. No. Mi relación con Dios va mejorando porque cada día estoy con Él y voy siguiendo el camino de Dios. Y no sé, por mi futuro creo que Dios sabe lo que me va a pasar. Two things really stood out there to me. Now I feel like a normal girl. Mm. And yeah. now I can talk to God again. Where's Blanca now? What's going on with her? She's doing wonderful, um, focusing on her education. Um, as many of you know, when you have, get a, receive a child like that, um, education has been at the bottom of her list as far as survival. Um, yeah. But now she's excelling. She's getting all, I guess it would be A's, 9's, and 10's in, <laughs> in classes, and just focused on where she wants to be. And um, her relationship with God is amazing. And her leadership with her, her siblings is is awesome to watch, yeah. Thank you guys for being there for her. That's huge. We get to see that and see that somebody who didn't want to hear from God, didn't want to talk about God, has moved from that to not only being willing to talk about it, but leading others to do it, so yeah. awesome. Steve Owens is one of our elders here. Steve, I want to ask you to come on up. Uh, he's been involved with the Hacienda for a very long time, uh, and he is uh, on the board uh, he's also on our missions committee here, and so Steve's going to talk to us a little bit about um, what we're going to try to accomplish here in March. So tell us, I guess, first of all, when are we going to do it, and how much are we going to try and raise this first Sunday in it's, March? It's, I think it's three weeks away, March 4th. That's when we typically have done it, the first week of March. Uh, the goal this year is $272,000. Let that sink in a little. $272,000. Okay. And now this is, the, this is the only funding, the only mission work we fund, the only foreign mission work we fund. And it's not, uh, the, the staff salaries are in our church budget. When you give on Sunday, a part of that money goes to pay for staff salaries. This is all going to kids and the tools that we need to take care of those kids, right? Yeah, I mean, I, and, and I want to say, you know, I don't take it lightly. That's a challenge. That's a challenge. We're a very blessed church, but that's a challenge. And I understand that, and the committee understands that. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, we talked about it. Says, this is what we need, okay? Uh, 
if you really back up to the total budget, we, we're spending almost $650,000 a year. It's a major operation down there and some major, some ex exciting work being done, right? Uh, so we have other partners, but, but we're over half of it, and, and at the end of the day, we are the ones that, that are sponsoring this, and we're the ones that, that back it up. Uh, over 75% of that, somewhere around 75% of that goes for the child care and all the ser family services and all that work that's going on. Over 15% goes towards the school, and the rest is where we have some evangelism work going on down there along with, uh, uh, you know, just the travel and insurance we're putting in place and some other things like that. So, uh, you know, I've done this, you can ask the committee members, I'm the budget guy. I, I can't seem to get rid of that. I'm stuck with it. But there's nothing frivolous in this budget. You know, this is the money it takes. I, and I've, you can ask these guys, I ride herd pretty hard uh, on what, what we're doing, and I, I don't just let them just throw things in there because... Uh, we, we have to live within our bounds, but, but this is what we need, and this is what we have to have to continue this work. Uh, even the construction is going on. We've done that external. That's not even included in those numbers I just gave you, by the way. Uh, so, so I'm putting a challenge out there. I, you know, I just want you to be praying about that and thinking about it. I, I know it's, it's more than last year, not that much more, but more. Uh, it's a great work. We've got a great uh, set of leaders here that are, that are running the work, and you can see the passion in them. Uh, and you can see what's happening. Uh, we're not always successful, but uh, it's really some good work. And I think God has led us down there to do this work in, in Ecuador. Not always successful, but faithful. And there's a big difference there. What if we don't, uh, Steve, what if, uh, let's say that I want to give some money, but I'm, I don't, I'm not liquid right now. What can I do to, is there a way I can? Yeah. Uh, so every year, the ones that have been here, if you hadn't, uh, we don't just say, hey, you got to show up with that day, it's it. We, we, we're going to send pledge cards to you in the mail, uh, and, and people give weekly, people give monthly, whatever, whatever works for you. If you. A lot of people just give it that day, and, and they're done. That's fine. But we do give you an opportunity, so if, you, if the money's not right there then, or you want to give it at the end of the year, or those kind of things, that's fine. We just want to have some idea of what's coming uh, so we can plan effectively as we go forward. So you will get a pledge card, and if it's a one-time gift, fine. If it's not, then, you know, just put it all in the pledge card, and so we'll have some idea what, what we can expect. Steve, thank you. Guys, thank you very much. Thank Give you. these guys a hand. Thank Steve. you. I just want to say thank you for letting us be a part of this work with you. Uh, this work started in 2002, before we were ever down there. So I want to clarify, it is only because of you that we're able to change lives in Ecuador, that we're able to heal families and protect children. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We're going to have a, you get, wait right here. We're going to have our el elders come on up. I'm going to have our elders, uh, all our shepherds come up here. We're going to have a prayer with these guys. Uh, John Perry, is, uh, who's been involved in this work, has been uh, involved in that heavily. He's going to lead, he's gonna lead us in a prayer. Uh, we love you guys. We're proud of what you're doing. We're proud to be a part of it. So let's pray together. Holy Father, we, uh, we humbly submit ourselves to you. And at this moment, we, we thank you for, for touching our hearts with uh, the stories of Blanca and the children at the Hacienda of Hope. Uh, Father, we thank you for your humble servants, Justin and Jana. Thank you for the dedication and, and commitment they've made to you and to the children there. Thank you for the example they set for this congregation, for the way they give their lives and, and sacrifice their, their time and their effort. Father, we pray a blessing on them, on Justin and John, their marriage, their family, their, their home. Just uh, continue to, to build them up, give them the energy and the, the, the vision that they need to, to do your work there. And Father, for Twickenham, we, we are thankful for the way you have shown us your mercy through this work. We thank you for the ways that you've demonstrated to us how to be your hands and feet. Help us to step into that and to continually give of ourselves in this work and so many others. Father, I pray that you'll touch our hearts to continue to give like we've done in the past. You've blessed us so richly and you've uh, you provided where we didn't know the way. Father, give us greater faith, greater trust to understand your ways and to step in, into your, your plans. Again, thank you for, for this opportunity. Thank you for uh, the talents that you give to Justin and Jonna, the way they administrate your program there. And Father, it's all in the name of Jesus that we do this. And to help us to always keep, keep
keep him in sight, to know that, uh, that he is the reason that you have uh, put this before us. And Father, we pray that uh, we look forward to the day that, that Jesus comes again. We pray that he'll come quickly. In the meantime, Lord, just continue to inspire us and to lead us in this and so many ministries. In Jesus' name, amen. Watching over my soul, my soul to keep guarding over me ever, watching wherever I go. And when the winds blow, and he is my shelter, when I'm lost and alone, he rescues me. And when the lion comes, he is my victory. Constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. We are his children and he is our father. Watching over our soul. Great is his love for his sons and his daughters. Watching wherever we go. Constantly watching over me. And when the winds blow, he is my shelter. And when I'm lost and alone, he rescues me. And when the lion comes, he is my victory. Constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. Check your bulletin for upcoming events. Thanks for being here. It was a great morning of worship and information. Amen. And listen, be praying about March 4th and be praying for these guys all the time. All right? Don't ever stop. Thanks for being here. Have a great week. Jim, let's close in prayer. Father, because of what your son went through for us, we can really call you your father. You have adopted us as your children, and those of us who have children appreciate what that really means. We have trouble comprehending your great love for us. We try to be like your son was here on the earth, but we fail so many times. We ask forgiveness for all the times we have sinned and disappointed you. Give us peace of mind knowing that you have said you will forgive us and not hold our sins against us. We appreciate all the pain that your son went through for us. Help us to love you and our neighbors as we love ourselves. Help us to give you credit for all the good things in our lives. And help us make everything we do at work or play a worship dedicated to you. Help us to be brave, brave in telling your son's story to everyone with whom we come in contact. In Jesus' wonderful name we make this prayer. Amen.